not. So Start good evening, all of you. Welcome to this 90th edition of Thursday Musings, a very important and practical topic by our young uh, speaker today. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, share the next slide. So let me hand over the session to Professor Dr. Tofan Pati, sir. He is the chairperson of this program. Uh, the rules, housekeeping rules are simple. We have muted everyone. The host and co-host can unmute themselves. You can put the questions in the chat box. The recording will be available on our Facebook page. And sir, over to you now. Thank you, Dr. Lim. And thanks all the participants over here. We are increasing every moment. And let me introduce our moderators first, Dr. Alim Siddiqui, President of Indian Psychiatric Society and a vibrant young psychiatrist and a future of IPS, a professor of psychiatry in Nechudi Neras Lucknow Medical College and Hospital, and Dr. Amrit Patojosi, who is also a professor of psychiatry in uh, Itech Medical College, Katak, and he's a direct council member of Indian Psychiatric Society editor of Odisha Journal of Psychiatry, and he's a coordinator of UNICEF WHO IPS Initiative on Telemedicine. Welcome, Dr. Amrit. Thank you. Sir. And I have the pleasure to introduce our vibrant chairpersons. Dr. Vijay Kumar Harvey Sitter, who is a very much well-known name in psychiatry in India. He's a consultant psychiatrist at Padma Sri Diagnostics, Vijayanagar, Bangalore and Medical Advisor Health Hill Geriatric Home Healthcare for Residential Care Services in Bangalore. He completed DPM from NIMANS in 2002, then got his MRC Psych in 2006, and MMD Science in 2008 from England, and CCT in 2015. He has worked as both consultant and faculty in England and NIMANS, aging, dementia, geriatric psychiatry, sleep disorders, occupational and mental health, are his areas of special interest. But in to today's topic, he received training on MET at Leeds Addiction Unit, MET training as part of addiction postings, which included supervision using the CD recordings of session with the clients. He has over 20 years of psychiatry experience with more than 30 scientific publications with H index of 11. He is currently editor of Journal of Psychiatry Spectrum, official publication IPS Jersey, to be regulated shortly. He has also authored more than 120 public awareness articles in popular regional and national newspapers. Welcome, Dr. Vijay. Next, another young and dynamic psychiatrist as the next chairperson, Dr. Danis Samad, MBBS from Rajiv Gandhi University of Health Sciences, DPM from CIP, and senior residency from CIP. Currently working as consultant psychiatry in Max Super Specialty Hospital, Saket, New Delhi, and has been serving as the director of psychiatry in Dood, Hope, the Addiction, and Rehabilitation Center in Delhi. On panel of Jomato as psychiatrist, formerly worked as a psychiatrist in Tulsi Drug Rehabilitation and Addiction Center, Safe House Drug Addiction and Rehabilitation Center, Delhi, Sanjeevan Hospital, Al Shifa Hospital, Kronos Hospital, Delhi. Sheva Kuti, a juvenile home run by government for teens and adolescents in conflict with law, and Fulawadi Children's Home and Asian Children's Home advice. A third and chapter, Coping with COVID-19 Psychological Strategies in Healthcare Workers, for the book, Nursing Manual, Critical Care and COVID-19 Compendium. Delivered a talk on stress management in COVID times organized by the Indian Society of Critical Care Medicine has given various tracks on stress management for employees of Indian Oil, Tata Consult, TCS, TTI, and other organizations, conduct various workshops on sensitization of good touch and bad touch for kindergarten and elementary school children and parents in Delhi schools, deliver tracks and addiction in various schools in Delhi. Such an active psychiatrist, Dr. Dennis Mohammed, I welcome you both, Dr. Mohammed, as well as Dr. Vijay, and now onwards, the stage is yours. Please take over. And you can display the second slide so that Dr. Vijay introduces your speaker. Yes. Okay. Uh, thanks, uh, Professor Tupan Pati, uh, Dr. Alim Siddiqui, and uh, 
Dr. Amrit Pachoshi uh, for inviting me. It's an honor to be here. Um, been following uh, your programs and uh, they are uh, truly uh, educative and uh, very helpful for PGs and uh, even practitioners. Uh, so without wasting much time, uh, we have a young uh, energetic uh, uh, speaker, Dr. Udit Panda, who has done his MD psychiatry from uh, the SCBMC at uh, Katak. And then he completed also completed the DNB uh, psychiatry. Then uh, he completed the uh, PDF, the postdoctoral fellow uh, one-year program at Nimhans in addiction medicine. And also he was a senior residency, he has, has completed his senior residency at Ames, New Delhi, and the National uh, Drug Related uh, Center, I think. And uh, his, his current position is Assistant Professor of Psychiatry at Kalinga Institute of Medical Sciences at Bhuvaneshwar. He's also in charge faculty for de-addiction services at the same uh, institute. His past positions included the uh, consultant psychiatrist at Nimhans Digital Academy in Bangalore. Uh, and uh, his special interest includes stigma and substance use, opiate uh, uh, opiate uh, substitution therapy, harm reduction, uh, harm reduction therapy. He has over uh, 20 publications in international and national indexed uh, journals, and he's, uh, he's also got five book chapters to his credit. Uh, so I would invite Dr. Udit Panda. Uh, before that, I think I need to hand over to uh, Dr. Danish Ahmed for introducing the topic. Over to you, Dr. Danish. Uh, Danish, please unmute. Yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Good evening to all of you. So it gives me great pleasure to speak to all of you this evening and to welcome you all to another chapter of this great learning exercise that is the Thursday Musings. So the topic for today is very pertinent and very important. Uh, that is the unwilling client of substance abuse and using the motivational intervening principles to evoke a change. Now, it is, you can say, the most important question in addiction as to what's to be done for a client who's unwilling and who's under your care. For example, I've had the chance of being uh, a part of the center which has both voluntary patients who are there by their own will and at the same time involuntary patients in two separate facilities who are uh, under section 89. Now, the most important question that we us to ourselves and we have to explain the families also patient you know once the detox is over after a week's time and after two weeks time and the patient is comfortable and he's under your and he's under an involuntary admission now you know that the patient might get discharged with within a month's time now what's to be done how to motivate the patient to bring about a change and the patient who's not willing at that point of time, who's not motivated enough. So the most important thing that comes to your mind, you know, in Hindi, you can say ki, what we explain to the patients, ki patient ki jeb mein paise hai, bahar alcohol ki shop legal hai, yeah, weed is very easy to buy and even to grow. How And the patient is not motivated right now, he's into addiction. Ab karna kya hai situation ke dar, how to stop the person and how to motivate the person. And as compared to any psychotic disorder, this is much more tough to handle. Because in psychotic disorder, once the psychosis is handled, it is much more easier to get a patient into the inside and to help him with his insight as compared to a person who's not willing at that point of time to quit the substance and who's not into psychosis also. So very important topic and that's why we have a very important guest to deliver the topic. So I would like to hand over the mic to the moderator and to Mr. Uh, and to Dr. Panda to take it over from here. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, uh, organizers, uh, chairperson, Dr. Topan, and uh, the moderator, Dr. Amit, and Dr. Alin for the opportunity. It's very humbling to be joining this forum which I have been pursuing for the last maybe a year or so as a student. Uh, without any further ado, I'll probably go straight to the topic. 
give me a moment to share my screen and let's start. Sorry. Uh, so what I'll be doing is uh, I'll I have actually prepared uh, two sets of videos. Your your screen is not shared. I know, sir. I I actually paused it to basically give an intro regarding the video. So uh, I have actually prepared two sets of videos. Uh, uh, one is uh, basically um, the. Uh, one actually, uh, it's, it's, it's a dialogue between a doctor and a patient. I uh, have played the role of the doctor and my colleague, Dr. Daniel from Imhats has played the role of patient. Uh, so uh, first we'll listen to the dialogue. It's a very short video, maybe five minutes long. Uh, the scenario is that there is a father who has come to a general physician for the repeated ear infection of his child. The doctor has addressed the child's uh, issue but somehow he found out that the father smokes regularly at his home. So he wants to talk about the smoking habit of the father. So there are two ways that has been done in the video. You have to tell me which one is right. I'll start out with the first video. Is the video stuck somewhere, Udit? No. Yeah, sorry, uh, was there a problem? Is, the audio is clear, no? Dr. Amrit, can you please confirm? The video, video is not coming to my... Oh, we are not seeing anything. We are not seeing anything. Yeah, we are just seeing, seeing your We are just seeing oh. your uh, desktop. That's it. Oh, okay. Uh, give me a moment and probably some issue. How about now? Yeah. Great. Volume? Yes. Volume yes. We cannot hear anything. No. Uh, volume is not there. Dr. Uzit? Uh, you have to share the volume, I think. The video's volume is not uh, audible. Computer sound and then video. Ret retry again. I'm doing that. Sir. Welcome to the uh, uh, role play demonstration. I am Dr. Udit Panda. I am a consultant psychiatrist uh, working at Neman's Digital Academy. I'll be playing the Sorry, the voice is gone now again. Oh, either video or voice. Okay. okay. Uh, you just do the audio then. We'll go ahead with the okay. audio only. Yeah, yeah. Just the audio will do. Okay. Myself, Dr. Daniel. I am currently working as senior resident in uh, the Man's Digital Academy. So Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. So, Daniel has agreed to play the role of the patient uh, in this uh, role play. Then the case scenario is uh, that a 40 year old uh, man who is currently employed in a private setup has come to his family physician with his son. He wants to get him evaluated for repeated ear infections. Now the doctor has found out that the father is a smoker. They had filled out some questionnaire and there the doctor found out the father is a smoker. The following is the conversation where the doctor is trying to advise the father to quit smoking. I'll begin. Uh, hi. So uh, I wrote a prescription for an antibiotic for your son. That will help help with the ear infection. But it seems like he has had six or seven of these infections in just the past one year. That's really a big problem. Yeah, it's pretty stressful for uh, both of us doctor and it's really upsetting for us. Uh, well, one of the primary risk factors for multiple ear infections in kids is usually smoke exposure. 
Are you smoking at home? Um, yeah, I do smoking, but uh, I don't smoke around him. I try really hard not to smoke around him, doctor. Oh, the the fact that he's having these ear infections, no, it's indicating to me that he is being exposed to smoke. What can you tell me about that? Oh, I don't know. Uh, I mean, I really uh, try hard not to smoke around him, and uh, I don't smoke in the car around him. and uh, when he is in home i go outside to smoke i just i mean i know it's bad and i know it's bad for him so i don't want him to be around i really try hard doctor not to smoke in front of him see uh, i i really need you to quit smoking both for your health and your son's health uh, did you know that smoking around your child is associated with not only ear infections but it would get to a point where you have to put tubes in his ear pretty shortly There are also things like vitamin C deficiency, dental cavities, behavioral problems, asthma, so many other respiratory infections. It's putting him in a lot of risk. In addition to uh, kids of smokers end up smoking themselves. You want him to be a, a, a smoker when he grows up like you? No, no. Mm, I have thought about uh, quitting doctor but uh, it's just really hard for me. I just don't know how to go about it. Okay well now it's uh, time uh, to quit it has really gotten to the point where you can't really keep smoking not only for him like i said but also for you you are putting yourself at risk for lung cancer for emphysema oral cancer heart disease all kinds of diseases oh i know i know i have had people have told me before i have had all that i just don't know how to do it now how i am supposed to quit it's so hard for me doctor what hard there are all kinds of things you can use now It's not as hard as it used to be in the past. You know, you can use uh, nicotine replacement therapies like patches, uh, lozenges, gum. There is a nicotine spray available right now in Amazon. Uh, you can uh, take various medicines like Champix or Bupron. You can try counseling. There are so many quit lines, so many help lines, so many counselors available to talk to. There is absolutely no reason why you should not be able to quit. This is really important that you understand this. Oh, I know it is. Uh, I mean, everybody has uh, problems, right? For me, it's uh, just really hard. Well, uh, what can be more important to you than health of your child? I, I don't really understand. I don't know how uh, I'm going to convince you, but you really need to tell me right now that you are going to quit smoking. This is very, very important. Okay. I'll go and look at all those things and I guess I try to find something. I'll talk to a counselor about it. Is that okay? Uh well, uh I think you really need to think about it seriously. But this time it, it has gone too far. Like I said, it's really putting yourself and your child in danger. I'm very serious. Okay, doctor. Whatever. I'll see what I can do for that. Thank you. Okay. Mm, I'm sorry for the mess up. I did not expect this to happen. but what do you think about the interaction can you give your comments in the uh, session yeah. whether it was yeah uh, uh, i request the audience people in the audience to give their comments in the chat box so i can read or if you want to i don't yes sir uh, that would be great out of 2200 uh, it's very difficult so can you put your qu- uh, queries comments in the uh, chat box it's a very interesting video um authoritative fine super correct okay from my side uh, what how not to do a meeting <laughs> but uh, very sad, aggressive approach that is how almost every uh, conversation between the patient and the doctor goes in most of the settings actually it is a very common scenario when you visit a general practitioner when you see yes. when a patient visits physician or a, a cancer surgeon these are the words that you hear in the opd yes so many good judgmental rest- critical judgmental and critical it's it's very good to discuss um general practice treatment not validating the concerns of the client sounds judgmental demoralizing uh, lecturing yeah lecturing perfect directive very aggressive approach okay sir and uh, reactive so, lack of we thought everything you had to uh, dr udit you yes yes you yes i think yes. very interesting audience i i must yes. thank the audience they are very attentive they are very uh, they are all, almost ready so udit it's all over to you again yes sir thank you so much so i am very really happy uh, people understand what not to do so it would be easy for me to communicate what to do in an mi session somebody does not want to meet you again dr udit Yeah, yeah, that's. He said whatever I I got the clue. <laughs> Never to meet him again. So continue, continue. Okay, so uh, I'll begin my presentation now. Uh, we'll probably keep this uh, video in mind, and we'll 
maybe a look at a different person at the end of the presentation. So this is the topic that I'm discussing today, how to use MI for an unwilling client of substance use disorder. Uh, uh, this is uh, the outline of my presentation. I'll be talking a little bit about the history of motivation driven because it fascinates me so much. So that's primarily the reason. Then we'll talk about the concept of change, motivation and ambivalence. Then the spirit of MI, the principles of MI and the techniques to identify and elicit change talk. Uh, I'll be uh, very frank, when, when I was doing my residency, for me, motivation interviewing was just a set of acronyms. It was DARE, SPORTS, and DANCAT. That's all I had to remember. I hardly used it in my uh, you know, clinical practice when I was seeing cases. But when I started venturing into uh, addictive disorders exclusively, I had actually uh, uh, done that for like three to four years of my career. I thought that there is a lot of people that you know, uh, that come to us that are not actually willing to quit and they have been coerced or have been forced by the family members to come. So we need something. We need something to be able to manage them, to be able to motivate them, to commit to the treatment, to stay in the treatment and ultimately to bring a change in pain. Uh, this line, this line is taken from a very old book from 1950s. And it's, it's written that addicts are pathological liars, use immature differences like denial and rationalization. They're very out of touch with reality and very, very difficult to communicate with. You'll be surprised to know that DSM-1 and DSM-2 actually classified substance use disorders as part of personality disorder, sociopathy personality disorder to the size. After maybe uh, the late 70s and 80s, the, the outlook towards addictive disorders started to change. Uh, this is exactly what was taught to Dr. William Miller. Uh, when he actually joined his first residency program in a, in a uh, center which was catering to uh, clients with addictive uh, problem, mostly alcohol use problem. When he started, he did not know much about addiction. He started talking to people and he kind of, he got confused because nobody, none of his clients that he, he spoke to were actually, you know, uh, using immature defenses, were actually condescending, were actually very difficult to talk to. They're actually very different. So he got confused. He thought maybe this area has different kind of addicts. Somehow, over the next two, three years, he actually conducted a, a randomized control trial himself along with his team. Uh, he chose a set of patients whom, who, who were actually undergoing a therapist-directed uh, therapist -directed behavioral intervention. There was a set of people whom they gave just a book let's call it bibliotherapy. So they gave a book which had some instructions and they spoke to them briefly. And two other set of patients, they were sent home uh, on a waiting list that you come back after some week we're currently occupied and we'll probably talk to you later. He saw that people who were you know, sent home with a book and were spoken briefly, they actually had a better result. Their drinkings per week actually came down much more as compared to the therapist directly. Uh, population. Whereas people who were not told anything were on the wet list, they did not have much reduction in their drinking game. So we conducted this study again in the next year, again in the next year, talk about denial. Because he was unable to understand this whole scenario, to what, why is this happening? We are supposed to treat, we are giving a treatment, it is supposed to work. Uh, so he, he came up with uh, some ideas about why this is happening. So uh, he actually wrote down a white paper and published it in a, in a journal. Uh, he, there are a few you know, summary points that I've outlined. He said that the person, rather the, than the clinician, should be making arguments for a change in a behavior. In this context, alcoholics. Evoke the person's own concerns and own motivation about changing that behavior. Listen with empathy. Minimize the resistance if the person is showing. Do not oppose it and nurture hope and optimism. But if you're doing that, then probably your outcome would be better in a person who is not really ready to let go of a behavior, alcohol use or otherwise. Uh, then he met with uh, Dr. Rolnik while on a trip to Sydney. Dr. Rolnik was, uh, had read his paper and he was also doing the same thing in Glasgow. They sat down, talked about it, and they said, you will collaborate. We will do further studies. So they did another study where they actually no, same set of therapists, they did two approaches. Uh, one was a confrontative and a directive approach. Uh, the other one is supportive and reflective. Approach. And there is another group of patients who are on the wet list. Uh, 
as you see. Here also, they saw that people who are using the MI approach or the supportive reflective approach, they had a better outcome. The drinkings per week, which is one of the standard parameters to see the progression of alcohol, actually decreased over time. So with that, they actually thought ki we are onto something. So a lot of pieces of the puzzle they had found through a lot of studies they had done. This is the outline of what they started out with. They said ki brief conversations can actually make a difference. It matters what a therapist does. So it's therapist specific as well, not only person or patient specific. Counselor's empathy predicts client change. Confrontation undermines the change. And given a brief intervention, the clients went ahead and changed without any treatment. So this is, you can see, as the foundation of the MI, they uh, sat down or wrote together a book, the first book on motivation determining helping people change. The first edition came out. And after that, there has been multiple studies and multiple uh, you know, trials that have been going on. The literature and the approach has been modified. A lot of people have been using it. So the story goes on. Before coming to MI proper, I'd like to talk about a few concepts. The first one is change. What's change? Change is basically going from a point to another point. So in this context of substance use, from drinking to non-drinking, or from drinking, let's say, 10 pegs per day to drinking only in the weekends. That thing doesn't happen overnight for most of us. Okay. There is a fellow, William James, he has actually written an article on uh, spirituality into 1903. He talks about two types of change in human life. The first one is an educational change that you learn from your mistakes, learn from your experience, and ultimately change over a period of time. Type two change is a kind of an epiphany happened and suddenly at one point you are drinking, the next day you are not drinking. Quite sadly, that doesn't happen very often. Maybe some of your clients, they came to a clinic, talked to you, and after that they're sober, but that would be happening one in maybe a million. Other clients, they struggle. They struggle for over a period of time before they actually bring about a change. So uh, change takes time. Change is hard. Maintaining the change can be challenging. The pace of change is variable for each person. Knowledge alone about the impact of the change is not sufficient to make change. And relapse to the previous behavior from B to A is also part of change. So this is the whole concept that the first book of the principles that I talked about. Taking this into account, uh, another two, one of the gentlemen, Prochaska and De Clemente, they gave the trans theoretical model of change. So basically, they put a label on the stage the you know, people are in regarding a change of their behavior. That's very famous the pre contemplation, contemplation, preparation, action, and maintenance. Pre contemplation when, is when you are saying no. I'm not going to stop drinking. Alcohol is part of who I am. I'm enjoying my alcohol. And there is no reason I should be considering to stop it. Contemplation is that stage of ambivalence, that stage of seesaw. Yeah, okay, I like my uh, no evening drinks, but I am fighting with my spouse so much uh, regarding my drinking behavior. The mornings are getting difficult, all those the kind of situations. Preparation is when the person is actually committing to do something, but still is engaging in the old behavior. Action is when you take steps, actually bring about a change in the behavior. In this context, reduce or stop drinking. Maintenance is when you continue that change. So from A to B, you move to the B zone, you stop drinking and you are maintaining that. You may maintain for a long period of time, ultimately get out of the cycle or may fall back to the previous pattern and relapse. So this is known as the trans theoretical model or the cycle of change. They also said, Prochaska and De Clemente, change is malleable and it is dynamic, which means that someone who is in maintenance phase today might go back to pre contemplation phase the very next day. Someone who has come to a clinic on a pre contemplation phase might actually go to preparation phase when they are getting out of the clinic. So it is that dynamic. It changes on a time to time basis depending upon the internal and external drive. So we understood the, the uh, vague philosophical concept of change. Now let's talk about ambivalence. Now when anybody, any of us is considering change, we have both the pros as well as the cons of making that change in a life. I want to buy a new car because no, 
uh, I have this uh, hot summer that is burning my city. I am getting darker due to exposure to sun. So these are the pros of buying a new car. But the cons again, it takes a hell lot of money from my savings. The petrol prices are rising like anything. Uh, I do not know driving that well, so I might be putting myself in other service. When I am talking about, no, talking sentences that basically helps me maintain a behavior. So for this example, let's say ki not buying a car. It is known as sustained talk. In case of alcohol, there is an example that is written. Alcohol helps me fall asleep. I can handle my drinking well. When I drink, I feel relaxed. Drinking helps me mix with people. So these are sustained talks for drinking. What would be the opposite of that? That would be chain talk. So when we're talking and you are indicating that you are going to bring about a change, maybe I can stop drinking every day. Alcohol is ruining my family life now. I should drink only on Sundays. I should be drinking only beer. So whatever it may be. Huh? So on one side, that is sustained talk. One on the other side, there is change talk. This is the whole situation of ambivalence for any behavior. When the sustained talk is higher, you're going to sustain the behavior. You're not going to bring about change. When the change talk is higher, you're going to bring about the change. But whatever the situation may be, your mind will always have both sides of the coin, both sustained talk as well as change talk. In MI, we actually focus on this. We try to elicit the ambivalence inside the person regarding the target behavior. We evoke that sustained and change talk from the client and ultimately try to increase the change talk so that the person actually goes ahead and brings the change in that way. So that's essentially what is done in MI. Uh, okay, let's uh, go to this slide. So what is MI? MI is not something, not a tool for you to be able to manipulate people into doing something that they do not want to do. That's what MI is not. It is actually a way of talking to people. A way of talking to people about something, about a behavior uh, or about you know, a habit that they have mixed feelings about, whether they want to bring change or not. So that's what MI is essentially. So what's the aim of MI? First is to explore the ambivalence as we spoke. The second one is to help the client resolve the ambivalence and either elicit or increase the change talk. So that's what we're going to do over the next few slides. What we should not be doing when we're adapting the MI approach, we should not be having in your face tactics like what I was doing in the initial audio. We should not be confronting, we should not be shaming should not be expressing denial from ourselves. We should not be using the writing reflex. Writing reflex is, no, it's something that almost all of us have as doctors. If there is something wrong that we see in front of, we try to correct it immediately. You are looking fat, go uh, reduce your food intake. You are looking pale, go have some no, iron. You are looking dehydrated, go have some ORS. That's the writing reflex. Do not do that in a mind. And do not give unsolicited advice. Give advice only when the client requests for it and he permits you to give that advice. Do not give advice otherwise. So, what's the spirit of MI? Spirit of MI is basically um, the music, the music to the whole song of motives and telling. That's what, uh, you know, how Miller and Lonely describes it. They say, okay, without the spirit of MI, your motivus interviewing session is basically just plain words. It doesn't sound so thing. So ultimately it doesn't have any effect. The spirit of MI obviously has an acronym. It's space, partnership, acceptance, compassion, and evocation. Partnership means that you're collaborating with the person. You do not have an expert role in the whole interaction. It's the person who actually has the potential for a change and he will be bringing about the change. Acceptance is when you respect the person's autonomy to decide for himself. Compassion is when you are not deceiving, you are putting the client's best interest first. And evocation is when the best solutions actually come from the client rather than from you. So that's the spirit of MI. Next question comes, ki, is there any skills that we need to acquire to be able to do motive center? Yes, they, there are. They are called uh, with the acronym ORS and they are basically basic counseling skills for every therapist. Our O stands for open-ended questions. A stands for affirmation. 
R stands for reflective listening and S stands for summarize. I'm pretty sure almost every uh, one of you would be familiar with these techniques, but I'll just uh, give a bird's eye view about the code of them. Open-ended questions are basically questions where you cannot really answer this through uh, a yes or no or a brief answer. Uh, look at the example in the right side. Is alcohol affecting your job? The person will actually be able to answer with a yes or no. But if you ask how has alcohol impacted your job or your life, there has to some information that will be coming from the client that is not an yes or no answer. Do you want to quit smoking? The answer would be yes or no. What do you want to do with your smoking behavior? Again, it opens door for varied responses. So these are open-ended questions. Affirmation is recognizing the little strengths and acknowledging little positive behaviors in the client. Okay. So it, affirmation can be as little as keeping appointments or coming for a follow-up even after a relapse or no, uh, sticking with medication. So all these little, little things are basically when you continue to affirm, the self-efficacy of the client grows and ultimately they will be able to achieve the desired behavior. Third one, probably the most important one is reflective listening. What is reflective listening? Reflective listening is not basically, uh, no, in contrary to the belief, what we have normally read, that you show a mirror to the client, it's not that. It's not only the spoken words of the client that you reflect back. Also, you reflect back what the person is actually thinking and what, how the person is actually feeling about it. So you have to generate one hypothesis and you have to reflect. I'll give you a process on how reflection works. So this is how it works. So you see things, you hear things, and you integrate them with your own experience, maybe from a past client, from your own lived life. Then you make a hypothesis in your mind and give a reflection statement, not a question, reflection statement. The person might agree with it. He might not agree with it. But if he agrees with it, the conversation will continue. If he doesn't agree with, the conversation will still continue. So it basically opens door for further exploration of the ambivalence. Let's uh, no, explain that with a few examples. So uh, uh, a teenager has come to you. He has been using uh, heroin injections for the last six months now. Uh, he's not really willing to come to the doctor, but the parents are forced. Uh, he says, Ki, Doctor, you uh, have heroin try kiya hai, kya mere ko treat kare? Now You say, Ki, if you, you feel that since I have never taken any drugs, I'm the one who should not be giving any advice. To you. So that's a simple reflection. A double-sided reflection is when you basically take the positive as well as the negative side of the ambulance. Or that is, you take the, both the sustained talk as well as the change talk and present it together. So there's a good example written here. You made a mistake and it sounds like you feel bad about that, but you also think that your family is asking you to do too much. So that's you no know, siding with both the devil and the angel. Amplified reflection is when you basically amplify the impact of the person's statement to a higher degree. So the person said, Ki mere ko daru ke se koi problem nahi, or mere ko drugs karne se koi problem nahi. You say, so you do drugs, but you do not think that it has ever caused any problem in your life. The person will go back a little bit and maybe reflect back himself to what have I said. So these are reflection or reflective listening. Third one is summarizing. It basically happens at the end of every session when we're trying to discuss something else from a current topic. So basically submit all the reflection statement and give a summary. So these are the basic counseling skills that you require to be able to do motivation interviewing. I'll recap it again. The first one is open-ended questions. The second one is affirmation. The third one is reflective listening. And the final one is summarizing or summarizes. Okay. So uh, I'll have a little bit of water and I'll continue. When the principles of MI Basically, uh, the famous acronym again, dares, developing discrepancy, avoid argumentation, rolling with resistance, expressing empathy and supporting self -defense. What are they? Discrepancy was when uh, either you 
no demonstrate a dis, uh, discrepancy or demonstrate a difference between the goals and values of a person and his current behavior substances in this case uh, there are two examples that basically gives an idea on what developing discrepancy might be the therapist says how has drinking stopped you from doing what you want to do so we basically uh, putting alcohol drinking behavior and the values or the aspirations of a person on the same table and trying asking him to evaluate them both the next example the therapist says help me figure this out you have told me that keeping custody of your daughter and being a good parent are the most important things to you now how does alcohol fit into that scenario so again doing the same thing the the uh, no the distinction between what you aspire to do or what are your goals and how the current behavior fits into it avoid argumentations self explanatory basically they say you know in mi you have to dance with the clients not wrestle with them huh? do not get into a power trap or a power struggle uh, so do, do not engage in arguments it's never going to be productive then rolling with resistance resistance uh, in a unmotivated client can come in form of arguments can in come in form of denial can in, can come in form of ignoring and can come in form of interrupting so all this you must have experience while dealing with such clients do not oppose that do not oppose resistance it's it's never therapeutic to do that resistance is actually a uh, normal or uh, expected uh, in uh, the process of change and it is a signal for the therapist to be responding differently what are the techniques that you can use to deal with that how can you roll with resistance the first is obviously and will always be reflex so continue to reflect uh, when things are getting difficult you can actually shift focus so the person doesn't want to talk about his cannabis use you can talk about the relationship difficulty he is having with his classmates or the person don't doesn't want to talk about his alcohol use you can talk about his no problems with his concentration and memory so that's shifting focus and siding with the negative it's it's another form of reflective listening so these are the techniques that you can utilize to roll with resistance express empathy empathy uh, so this is it talks about the rosarian empathy which carl rogers talked about it's mostly you no know, linked with reflective listening so if you reflect well the person understands that you are willing to understand them so that in itself communicates empathy from the therapist to the clients you can look at the examples i understand you feel frustrated because you relapsed after quitting smoking for a year so the person actually the empathy is communicated so it encourages the client to keep talking and maybe ultimately promote self efficacy self efficacy is the belief in the ability of the person or belief in the ability of the self to be able to bring about change this is another neglected uh, but very very important step that we should be keeping in mind if self efficacy is inadequate relapse is bound to happen or the change might not come at all so always focus on increasing self efficacy okay so i come to the last part that is change talk so i spoke about a lot of things ambivalence change dare sports but ultimately it boils down to change talk if change talk is happening in the therapy sessions you understand that you are making progress uh, how do you identify change talk again quite sadly there is another acronym for that this is known as the darn cat where d stands for desire when you listen that the person is saying statements like i want to reduce my drinking i want to stop drinking i do not want to uh, drink in front of my children e is the ability when the person says ki i can actually reduce my alcohol use or something like that r stands for reason i will reduce my drinking because it is hampering my family life or it is not uh, helping me work properly work to the best of my ability n stands for need i should be reducing my alcohol because my liver is getting fried day by day then cat cats uh, is the acronym for implementing change talk for c stands for commitment i will reduce my alcohol use because because of some reason or other activation is when the person is ready i am ready to do this i am ready to stay away from alcohol i am ready to 
let go of my friends who are drinking for some days. I'm ready to shift to a different location because I think I'll be able to stop alcohol. This that indicates activism. Finally, T is taking steps. When the person is actually doing, he says, I'm actually doing it. I'm reading books on how to stop alcohol. I'm no visiting the temple so that I gain my self-confidence back. That stands for T. So Dan Cat is a acronym for the statements that people say, which indicates change stop, which is good, which indicates that the person is actually moving from a pre-contemplation to a contemplation or a preparation phase of meetings. How do you do that? There are a few techniques that commonly used. There are actually a lot of them. I have listed out some. The first one is obviously the uh, most important uh, uh, tool that we used, which is open-ended questions. Keep asking open-ended questions. Chain stock will ultimately come. The next uh, something that uh, I commonly use is provoking extremes. Okay, suppose you do not change. Suppose you do not stop drinking. How do you think your life is going to be after maybe a year? Suppose you uh, no, continue using alcohol in the same manner. How do you think your relationship with your daughter is going to be maybe after two years or maybe after five years? So basically asking the person to think about the extreme situations. Uh, this is on the negative uh, side. On the positive side is looking forward. If you decide to stop, if you decide to make changes in your life right now, how is the life with the life going to be you no know, different maybe after a month or so so that is looking forward then uh, the importance and the confidence ruler i'll uh, give you two questions and you will understand that so let's say ki uh, i am the person who has alcohol dependence dr vijay is my uh, therapist and he asked me ki udit on a scale of 1 to 10 how important do you think no no leaving alcohol for you, how important it is right now. But 10 would be extremely important and zero would be not important at all. Let's say I responded to doctor, I think it would be six. Dr. Bizay follows up with a question. Why do you say six? I wonder why did you not say four? So I say, hey, doctor, uh, people have started identifying me as an alcoholic now because I'm drinking every day. So I think ultimately down the road, I have to stop. So this has become important. Then Dr. Bizay asks you, uh, it, you said six, you did not say nine. What is that? So I'll cite some reason, no? because I'll say ki maybe uh, I like drinking. Uh, alcohol makes me feel normal. So alcohol makes me feel okay. So you see, uh, with this tool, you are able to basically go probe into both sides of ambivalence. Same stands for confidence rule. How confident are you that you will be able to stop drinking right now on a scale of zero to 10? So that also probes both sides of ambivalence. So these are good tools to use, importance and confidence rulers. Finally, the famous of them all, the, um, the decisional matrix or the pro con table, the pros of continuing a behavior, the cons of continuing a behavior, the pros of bringing a change in the behavior and the cons of bringing change in the behavior. So the pros of drinking, the cons of drinking, Pros of quitting and the concept of quitting. So basically, you know, puts the whole ambivalence on a tabular format. People are able to see it. Your job as a therapist is to make sure the pros of quitting is higher and not the cons of quitting are higher. So that, that's, that's where you have to intervene. You have to guide. Okay. Uh, I have come to the end of my presentation. I'll be outlining what I think is important in the whole presentation. Please understand ambivalence is a natural part of change. It's a natural part of who we are. It's something that every human experiences. The purpose of motivation and interviewing is to enhance that ambivalence and then guide the client in the resolution of the ambivalence by eliciting more change talk. Open-ended questions and reflective listening are probably the most important in my skills that you require. They can be you know, mastered with uh, you know, time and again practice with every client that you see. Try asking open-ended questions. Initially, it is difficult. Initially, it is also difficult to basically reflect. But with time, when you practice, because you see, reflection is uh, very, very interesting. It gives you the result of your reflection immediately. The person actually tells the answer, how you reflected, by agreeing or not agreeing. So it's something that you know, is uh, 
acting on the operant conditioning, you will be able to master it quite quickly. The evocation of change or the evocation of the idea of change should come from the client, not from the therapist. The therapist will never be in the director seat in a MI session. He will be just in the guide seat and the driving will be done by the client and do not try to win the battle against a client with motivational uh, deficit or maybe on preconception phase of motivation on day one. Sometimes it will be like three or four sessions where you have to roll with resistance, but have specific goals, which are realistic, which are meaningful to the client, which are accessible and timed. So that is something that you should keep in mind. There are a few suggested reading. I have found three, these three books to be very, very useful. The first one is the uh, by the masters themselves, by Dr. Miller and Dr. Romlich, Motives Interviewing, Helping People Change. The next one has come up in 2016, the latest edition. I have talked about the utility of MI in different clinical scenarios. The final one is more appropriate for psychiatry uh, residents. It, it has a lot of examples, a lot of verbatims of the patients and clients so that the concepts are actually grasped a little better. You also have the BMJ learning where Dr. Ronick is actually one, te one of the teacher. It's a one hour uh, program, which you can do it freely and learn about MI in brief practices. Thank you so much. This is my mail ID if you have any queries. Uh, before taking queries, uh, I'll probably play the second video so that uh, we, we after that we can have a discussion. Is that okay, sir? Dr. Vijay? Dr. Dennis? Yeah, that will do. Yeah. Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Udit Panda and I'm working as a consultant psychiatrist with the Demands Digital Academy. Uh, today, me and my colleague Dr. Daniel will be demonstrating a role play and I'm playing part of the doctor. So uh, the case scenario which we will be playing is that a 40 year old man who is employed in a private company has come to his family physician with his son to get him evaluated for repeated ear infection. The doctor found out that the father is a smoker from a questionnaire he filled. The following is a conversation where the doctor is trying to advise the father to quit smoking. Uh, hi, Mr. D. So I wrote a prescription of antibiotics for your son. Okay. I did want to talk to you though. Uh, I'm a little bit concerned looking at uh, his chart that how many ear infections he has had recently. And I've also noticed that you have checked the box that someone is smoking at home. I was wondering if you can tell me a little more about it. Oh, well, doctor, uh, it's just me, my wife and uh, him. Uh, I do smoke. I really try hard not to smoke around him, but uh, I have been smoking for last 10 years and you know how private company jobs is so stressful these days and COVID had made many things very difficult for us. And I think uh, I started smoking after I joined this job only. Okay, well, Mr. D seems like you have a lot of things going on and smoking is kind of a way for you to relax and be stressed. Yeah, yes, of course, doctor. And uh, some people have to bear and I have a cigarette. Okay, sure. Uh, it sounds uh, like you're trying not to smoke around him. Uh, why did you make that decision? Why are you doing that? Um, yes, doctor, I know it's not good for him. And uh, I mean, I have uh, read those things about infections and asthma and stuff and all. But uh, other kids have ear infections and their parents don't smoke. Okay, so on one hand, you are worried uh, about how your smoking might be affecting him, your son. And on the other hand, you are not very sure whether uh, it is really the smoking that causing all these problems. Uh, do I understand you right? Yeah, right, doctor. Yeah, I mean, uh, he does not have asthma. He does not have a lot of other problems that, uh, that his other friends have. And I have thought about uh, quitting before in the past, but I just don't see how it's possible right now. May I know when did you quit and w what made you to decide to quit? Uh, the year my son was born, I was there with him for a lot of time as his mother was not keeping well. I just uh, don't think I could leave myself if something had happened to him. Okay, right now though, uh, it feels almost too difficult uh, not to manage without smoking or even to, to quit uh, at the current moment for you. 
yeah doctor exactly oh, oh may i ask how were you successful when you quit that time what did you do exactly i don't know doctor exactly but i think uh, about it now uh, i don't even know how i did it i just did it you know i just could not ma- imagine like uh, him being sick because of me also my wife made me swear on my boy so that uh, i was just enough to say okay you know what i am not going to risk that okay so the risk was so scary then that you were able to stop yourself from smoking right yeah exactly doctor but they don't feel as scary to you now mm, no doctor i mean uh, we are two separate people and i like and like i said i pretty good about that i also don't let other people smoke around him you know so you know i think okay so uh, seems that you are doing the best that you can do right now Yeah yeah doctor right you're right but you no know, I, i cannot help but notice it sounds to me that uh, a part of you really wants to quit yeah i know that i need to do and every new year i stay this year i am going to quit smoking but then something happens at work and quitting just does not happen so is it safe to assume that it's on your do to list but it's just not making to the top yeah exactly right doctor okay uh, if you did decide to quit uh on a scale of 0 or to 10 where 0 being not confident at all uh and 10 being maximum confidence uh where do you think you would start mm, probably i don't find kind of uh, in this unsure area like uh, i know i have done it before so i know i can do it but at the same time it just seems really hard and it's not the same situation right sure answer me this Uh, what made you say 5 rather than a 2 or a 3 i know all the ways it's bad for me and i don't want uh, him to grow up thinking that uh, it's okay to smoke actually i don't want him to use any substances and uh, so i know i need to especially before he gets old enough to understand what his father is doing but i just don't know if i can do it okay so it sounds like you have a lot of reasons uh, why you would like to quit you have been successful quitting in the past and right now you are just feeling a little bit hesitant about your ability to do it yeah right exactly doctor okay now tell me this uh, why do you think we should go from here i don't know um, i would like some help and i just don't know what kind of help i need even sure uh, well if you would be interested uh, there is something uh, that we can definitely talk to you about there is a lot of new options that can actually help people uh, be way more successful in their attempts to quitting than before there are different medicines that you can try but doctor i don't like taking medicines okay that's okay uh, the, the other options also there is a lot of support groups there are helplines that you can you know or talk to uh, there are people you know it's it's good to have people uh, with you when you go through this phase sometimes uh, just having that support can be a big part of quitting especially for people like you who are smoking it such a stress reliever that sound nice and uh, but i'm not sure even if i have time for all that doctor sure uh, i understand it feels like something that to take up a lot of time and maybe not fit for uh, no to be put into your life right now i wonder uh, if you could talk about uh, some other options that might uh, fit into your life uh, ahead oh that would be really nice doctor if you can talk about okay uh, let's take things a little slow if you are willing we could set up another appointment where we can uh, come in and we can talk more about uh, this oh, i would like that and it would be great help doctor great great so i'll see you next week sure thank you doctor thank you mr d okay dr udit that was an excellent uh, uh, interview uh, so uh, you have demonstrated uh, how not to do and then later after the your uh, uh, talk you then you presented uh, one probably a model one and uh, i think there's you know a lot of uh, comments and so people are participating people are interested in this it's very interesting um so where do we start um, dr danish i'll uh, i'll take few in the you know next few minutes and then i'll hand it over to you if that's okay with you okay so dr rk sharma says it's really interesting guiding through aggressive motivation interviewing but many times that that's probably related to the first video but many a times this approach also not effective many a times a patient actually don't uh, turn up uh, i think it takes repetitive hammering you want to comment dr ozit uh, okay uh, sir uh, this is um, sorry uh, some focus issue uh, 
this is more of a the my uh, clinical opinion than than science so let's assume that i have my uh, father who is drinking and who is not listening to me so there are two ways i can go about it i can uh, engage him in motivation interviewing and expect for him to have that motivation to change or i uh, engage in a hammering uh, session once then i get frustrated and fight with him and then let him go let him continue drinking so it's always better to engage in a uh, in a approach where you have uh, possibility of change and that's what mi says it's 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 ultimately the person who is going to change i see there is a question about the locus of control and motivation so when the locus of control becomes external that is the source of motivation becomes external the changes are unlikely to happen and if it if it happens it is not sustainable so when the locus and internal the the sustaining uh, uh, change or sustaining behavioral change happens so i think yes that's true that's why the therapy is designed it's designed for difficult clients and difficult clients are going to be difficult no matter what uh, therapeutic approach you take uh, i believe this is the best approach uh, to go about because what other options do we have quite you know practically so, so yes yeah. so continue with that have best regards for the person unconditional positive regard as they call in addiction and uh, keep the doors open because mi doesn't close the doors because you are not confronting then you are rolling with the resistance the door is always open when the person has some motivation and he looks back that the doctor said that he is going to help me whenever i need help so he is going to come back and that happens quite more frequently than we we can imagine so so i think that's still the best approach it's difficult sometimes the first two three four sessions might seem that you have failed but if you continue to maintain or hold the approach things will more likely turn around than not so that would be my answer dr uzi next question from drone uh, bandu tf and uh, he is asking sir as a person moves from moves along the stage of change is there any specific time period as far as he is in the ep care inpatient care we can do mi can we bring a change within that stay does okay. uh, doing ip care is is it possible coercion if calling and uh, imposing mi on him yeah what is so yes sir once again i'd like to remind uh, our uh, esteemed uh, audience that mi is not really uh, it's a way of talking to people I, i i'll call it again it's a way of talking to people it's motivation enhancement therapy on the other hand has agenda mi doesn't have agenda you can integrate into your you no know, day to day uh, habit of talking to people so you can start out with mi from the beginning uh, normally met is successful in people who have a deficient motivation so people who are in pre contemplation and contemplation phase of motivation they are likely to improve or they are likely to benefit from this therapeutic approach people who have already committed to the change who have already you know decided that they're going to quit they have themselves enrolled in a, a hospital and they are taking attempts to bring about that change in behavior uh, there are recent reports that mi can actually be counterproductive so uh, to answer the question specifically yes you can and you should always start a mi approach uh, in people who are in pre contemplation phase of motivation when they are co- coerced the locus for the motivation is external so the uh, external locus can be parents can be a lover can be the law can be police can be anybody but when you engage in mi you actually view or you actually elicit their reasons to be able to quit or you no know, to uh, not to quit quit or not to quit so that again becomes important so if you are able to motivate them towards bringing change stop then your job is done till that point you have to continue to do mi In relation to the same question what approach step should we take when client is in contemplation stage and show no interest uh, in bringing change is there any other uh, way apart from evoking ambivalence in case there is no entry point to create ambivalence okay uh, if you uh, the the uh, doctor is asking about the other therapeutic options i believe uh, a purely behavioral approach like contingency management sometimes helps because uh, uh you no know, in gambling disorder in cases of uh, cannabis dependence uh, sometimes mi becomes difficult so the clients are actually not permeable that much. so they are pure behavioral interventions behavioral therapy uh, or contingency management approaches they are more useful so there are scenarios where mi is not possible 
other approaches can be employed. Of course, there is no doubt. Uh, next question is, what is the percentage of genetic impact on addictive behavior? Can that be changed? I am not sure of the exact number, sir. So maybe the, one of the chair questions can address. But yes, there, obviously there is genetic vulnerability more so for alcohol dependence. Uh, I'm not sure of the numbers. I, I'm sorry. Is anybody any clue? Is anybody want to join? There's an interesting question, sir, if I can ask. Yes, bye. So I was thinking and I saw it in the chat box also. What? How do you do MET with a patient who is a binge? Six months, absolutely free. And suddenly, you know, 10 days, eight days, he lands up in, you know, in, in a complete mess. How do you change your strategy for such individuals? So I assume they're not going to uh, stick to treatment. Is that is that true? When they are sober, they are not engaging in the uh, treatment? Yeah. Uh, so, so when they come up, they, they come to you motivated or uh, that all depends upon the target of uh, treatment. People, people who are binge generally don't come themselves. Yes, yes. So they are brought. The uh, basic thing is they are, they are brought. They, they, uh, they are brought by their guardians and all. So I don't, do yeah, Dr. Amrit, I don't think the approach is going to change much. Ultimately, if, the, if we conceptualize the uh, addictive behavior as a disorder of motivation and not motivation in the spiritual sense, motivation in the sense of process can it. Then uh, binge drinking or no, harmful drinking or, or hazardous drinking, whatever you want to call it. How is it different from uh, alcohol dependence? So that's ultimately the people with alcohol dependence also have varied patterns. So if there is a deficit in motivation to no, basically stop the target behavior, which in this case is episodic heavy alcohol consumption. Then we can start our therapy on that focus, on that premise key. What, what is the, no, what is the reason behind drinking and what is the reason behind not stopping drinking? So uh, I don't think the approach is going to change much. It's, it's essentially the same framework that I've going for. Uh, are there any, uh, are there some changes in approach or different strategies we need to use for different substances, opiate versus alcohol or cannabis use? Okay, I'll share my experience here. It's, it's more to do with uh, cannabis versus alcohol because these are the two clientele population where I have uh, no, tried this. People with cannabis dependence, more so in younger population, uh, they are uh, really difficult. So they are the uh, shifting focus approaches uh, to rule, roll with resistance is something that we, we normally adopt. They normally in the in the initial session, if you start talking about substance per se, they are not going to talk to you. The next session doesn't ever come up. So what we do is we try to talk about their life, their uh, cognitive abilities. Then maybe in the next session, introduce what cannabis has a role to play in that, you know, their uh, approach to life or their cognitive abilities. Then ultimately from there on, we probably start introducing the whole talk about substances. So. Uh, uh, it's more lengthy, more sessions are required for cannabis dependence as compared to alcohol. It's, it's what my experience is. Uh, I would uh, request Dr. Danish to take over from here, please. Uh, Dr. Danish, uh, can you share your experiences when you were working in a uh, focus the addiction center regarding the topic today? So, so there are varied, varied experiences. So what happens is that we have uh, uh, different categories of patients from the ones who are very motivated to you can say semi-motivated in a voluntary center to someone who's completely not motivated and is in a involuntary center and is there for is there under the high support teams, right? So what usually happens is that the basic dilemma that we also face is that first thing is that once the detox is done for a person what we see clinically is that once the detox is done for a person they start to gain the strength the withdrawals are controlled their normal personality traits start to come up where they gain the confidence where they being in the denial state then they start demanding the discharge and the most common problem that the alcoholics have is that of a denial. 
alcoholics or any person who is into addiction the most common thing the most problematic thing and the most important first step to cover for us is that they are always in a denial regarding their illness now i feel that the most important thing that the patient requires from us from a, you know from the treatment point of view is empathy is am i using empathy so once the person is sure that this person this doctor this therapist means good for me and is not basically confronting me on everything okay so even if he may not agree with you in the first three four sessions but he develops that kind of trust in you i think that's the most important first step that you need to take care of once a person has developed that trust in you that this person even though if i am in an involuntary admission or a voluntary admission this doctor this therapist this psychologist means good to me he means good for me he's on my side he wants to help me out or he is not there to you know dictate terms to me he is not there to fight with me he is not there to give me unsolicited advice and that trust is there then even if he fails three times four times six times this eighth or ninth time when he has the motivation he will come back to you first of all and he is going to come back with a mindset of change and then it becomes all the more easier to work on him and to help him out of addiction thank you then, doctor yeah yeah, yeah. please please complete if you want to please go uh, doctor this first of all congrats from my side it was a really wonderful and lucid it was such a free flowing session and uh, thanks to the patient i think you improved a lot from the first interview to the second so you learned a lot from your presentation and we learned a lot <laughs> thank you so much and dr sharmista has said that what a wonderful patient it was so actually uh, th this is just for demo purpose actually what is actually happening in real life is much more difficult we are trying to compress the session so so regarding this there is a question by dr pfizer that there is an adolescent who is a disruptive adolescent who is not listening to at all what you are saying and you may you are also thinking about supported admission and all these things so so uh, how do you go about this thing? Uh, how do you apply am i there when the person is actually not listening to anything not even interacting with you the in fact the rapport formation is difficult yeah so so uh, sir uh, my approach normally is uh, in this cases is shifting focus uh, a lot of the times you no know, people who are coerced to come to a uh, to an addiction clinic or to a psychiatrist uh, normally the clients are apprehensive that this doctor is going to give me the same lecture that my parents or my family or my well wishers have been giving me for the last maybe 5 years or 10 years when the doctor doesn't do that in the first session he actually wants to listen what the person is experiencing as dr danish was actually referring to in his answer uh, the basically after the first session they normally they are not that uh, you no know, guarded they are not uh, that uh, impermeable anymore they start talking about it when they start talking about it uh, it would be a good idea maybe when you Uh, you are sure that the rapport has been established and the person is willing to talk about substance use then maybe start talking about it uh, i'll i'll tell you one experience about a, a third year medical student i believe there is a question regarding that so for the first two sessions i remember he came up with like uh, i believe uh, 15 or 20 news articles slash research papers on medical cannabis of course i had read them all but i still sat down to the two sessions to listen and and to uh, i i could easily uh, no counter agree with all the evidence that i have regarding cannabis use and how it causes a lot of mental illness how is it it is addictive but i did not do that i decided to roll with the resistance then finally uh, we started having the talk where he said ki how cannabis has actually taken over his uh, life how you no know, he has to engage in cannabis use and he is not able to engage in other activities how his family has started you no know, noticing it the change in his behavior and then from that point on the conversation moved forward so it's essentially the approach that is different it's nothing new that we are doing we were basically just you no know, not head butting but trying to move with the client that's you no know, that's it would be a good simile to, to so basically we are just waiting for him to land in a right yes, place yes yes so that is the therapist has to have a patience the family has to have patience yes and it will take a long amount of 
time and effort to actually uh, this develop this change in behavior yes and it's no golden bullet i that uh, let me put it there also but it's, it's not like anybody who is not considering a change right now yeah, they goes on to a therapeutic uh, mi session with one of us and he's going to change it's not that uh, it might be it opens a door for the change and the patient might decide after maybe roaming around a year or so may decide to come back to enter into that door again so that's it in in connection to this i'll mention something uh, there was a, a debate where i was asked to judge the debate was uh, the title of the debate was uh, cannabis is harmful and the debate was between four uh, adolescents versus you know college going students versus four qualified experienced psychiatrists and uh, in the end i had to lie that uh, the you know <laughs> the psychiatrist won <laughs> but uh, you know the the, the more hands uh, were raised in favor of uh, the adolescents uh, in the end so it's it's very difficult i think yeah. so can i add something to that yes please so in my experience i have seen that uh, what dr panda was saying was absolutely right in terms of approach to the adolescents in my approach what i have seen is that dealing with the adolescents sometimes is easier than dealing with adults because what happens is that there is a lot of dependency of the adolescents on the parents you know so there are a lot of checks and balances that you can play with not yourself but why are the parents in the adolescent phase i mean you know when the age is around 13 to 18 there are a lot of checks and balances that that can be taken care of so there are a lot of things which can be dealt with in an indirect way as compared to an adult who's already earning who's already has a bank account who's already got a job who's already lived his life and is completely independent you know so that that's what is somebody that for the example i was giving if somebody in his 30s and 40s has money in his pocket and there is a legal alcohol or legal alcohol shop outside and he is into addiction so what stops him from taking it so it, you have to completely and entirely depend on mi on mt on uh, you know moti- motivating him to leave, leave it now it might take many attempts it might take many years but in adolescents all, although they are they can be very problematic in the in those years and they can be very defiant and they can have a very torrid relationship with their parents but there is a lot of dependency on the parents as well so that can help that in these cases it does help when we set up limit setting and when there are few checks and balances in place so it helps them a lot as compared to adults like they are dependent for school for their fees for their expenses completely on the parents So all these things can play a role in helping them better. Thank you, Lance. Uh, Udit, there is a question. Uh, any guidance to apply MET, especially in context of internet gaming, as a disorder? Yes. Uh, last, I actually I was going through uh, you know whatever areas MET slash MI RCTs are being done. There is some work that has been done in uh, internet gaming disorder uh, in gambling. Um, Uh, the reports are that it's not as effective in behavioral addiction as it is in uh, alcohol or any chemical addiction for that matter but uh, the data is still novice to be able to comment definitively but essentially the approach remains the same they say ki for a gambling at least uh, a contingency management is likely to be more effective or a cbt approach is likely to be more effective as compared to uh, mbt approach so that's my reading um uh, it's a very gray area to to be very truthful about it okay now dilip dr dilip wants to ask about co addiction in caretakers slash family members so do you also incorporate this in mi um yes actually uh, so uh, mi actually can be incorporated into even in group settings even in uh, family or couple therapy settings uh so uh, when mi started at that point of time there is some johnson institute if i am not mistaken they actually started employing they were treating people uh, or the families of people who are in pre contemplation phase of motivation they actually did a rct over there and it was in 1980s 85 i believe so they did that and they uh, saw ki at least the distress tolerance and maybe co uh, dependent behavior and all that reduced with mi approach but then again the 
it's the maladaptive the behavior in target here when you are targeting uh, the families of people with uh, addiction is the codependency if if the codependency is reduced then the first thing that reduces is the distress in the family member uh, then maybe if the the you no know, future allows or the environment allows you need to target the addiction of the uh, patient person so ultimately so, addiction might not get corrected but the family's distress and the contribution of codependent co behavior is going to reduce for sure okay so what would be the adverse effects and where it should not be used yeah it should not be used if the person is in uh, no action or maintenance phase of motivation that is for sure so because it's it's likely to be counterproductive they are not looking for motivation as of now they they need uh, no to talk about uh, lapses and relapses or the last prevention model cbt is probably a better approach to go over there so uh, more initial phases only yes yes people who have deficient motivation that is in pre contemplation and contemplation phase of motivation they are the right candidates to be engaged in mit and this is mit we are talking about not mi okay there is a question that how does locus of control relate to stages of change any 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 link between those two uh, no link per se but this is a very interesting concept someone let's i'll give you uh, all an example let's say someone was uh, drinking and uh, Uh, he was creating ruckus in the street, and the police picked him up. He said, "The police said that you do not uh, go for treatment uh, center tomorrow morning. We are going to put you in lockup for the next six months." So he had to come, and uh, you ask him why have you come. He narrated the whole incident, and you ask him, "Are you ready to quit?" Not definitely. Do not want to go to jail. So he had the locus of motivating the person to decide uh, or to bring a change in his alcohol use behavior is external. mind you that this external locus of motivation doesn't bring a sustained motivation so the motivation is like to to fall back when the external environment is uh, mutilated or, or changes but if the locus of motivation is internal that is the person is actually deciding to quit because of his own values or own concerns or own difficulty then it is more likely that it is going to be a sustained motivation change so that's the difference there is no direct correlation between the stage of the change and the locus of the change that's not okay suppose a patient wants to uh, quit heroin but he doesn't want to touch on the alcohol and smoking part question by sharif yeah so, so very very pertinent question uh my answer would be you know we'll go back to the basics when we evaluate cases of substance use we actually write down the stage of motivation for different substances different so for heroin it is in contemplation phase of motivation for tobacco in most cases it is in pre contemplation phase of motivation your approach for each substance is going to be different so if someone is in pre contemplation phase of motivation you do not try to argue about that if someone is in preparation phase of motivation for alcohol you target that behavior accordingly so it's behavior specific than person specific per se but ultimately the whole experience counts what we have normally seen is that if you are able to engage the person in a single target behavior the other behaviors are normally you know they kind of they are dragged in and ultimately presented before you for example you start treating someone for pain abdomen maybe after two or three weeks he will start telling you about his anxiety and how is unable to fall asleep so it's like that you start treating uh, a more motivated substance and the less motivated substance will actually fall in that Okay, and uh, Dr. Suresh wants to ask difference between MI and MET. Yeah, MI is a style of uh, interviewing clients. It is based on a specific set of principles. MET is a structured therapy. Uh, MI is more uh, Rogerian. It's the philosophy is more uh, Rogerian in the sense it is more client-centered therapy that is there. So you basically the client has full potential to bring a change. They know what is best for them. your job is to act as a guide and basically navigate them met uses the principles of mi very faithfully but it is time bound and it has specific targets that i am going to target reduction in alcohol use i am going to target uh, less drinking in the weekends so that's how met differs from mi that's essentially the conceptual difference when in practice they both will look same okay and how short or brief can be the session 
suppose i am sitting in a busy opd so in how much least amount of time can i make a difference miller actually uh, the first paper that he wrote no he talked about it he said ki brief interventions are more useful than lengthy sessions uh there is a saying in the us navisin that the uh, less is more and more is less so so the basically if you drag that concept into the semi even if a five minute session where you are able to ask five pertinent open ended questions and reflected really really well with a support on the self efficacy and you are able to express your empathy in the whole uh, whole process then your job is done a lot of people who are in the early harmful stage of drinking they are going to bring a change in their behavior this is more more valued uh, knowledge for people who are working in primary care setup because they are going to be the people who are going to see these cases much more than us much more than practicing psychiatrist is what i mean to say so people with hazardous and harmful use of alcohol who are in pre contemplation phase of motivation even a brief 5 minute session is going to be effective in bringing a change in behavior of alcohol use and uh, the target is probably never uh, no abstinence from alcohol it is uh, probably a reduction in drinking and the number of drink free days this is what most of the studies take so yes it is effective in brief sessions also it is effective yeah, yeah so i think motivation covered... doing is a, yeah, yeah motivation doing is a skill that uh, will come after years of and years and years of practice must be incorporated must be a part of the you know pg training and uh, it also can be expanded to other branches of medicine also see for example even in suicide crisis or uh, you know in uh, uh, you know when there is a conflict between the couple uh, and they want to separate uh, you know in many way, you know many aspects uh, these uh, you know in anything any change even in obesity they want to uh, you know uh, uh, you know and compliance compliance to medications so you know you can create that ambivalence and uh, can work around it so this you know mi principles need to be expanded that can be part of the interview technique also and the current scenario where you don't know if uh, the client has come to you in your opd clinic and actually recording uh, what has been discussed so where uh, mo- if you practice motivation interviewing you are going to be easily saved because you are not giving any advice there and you are just listening and reflecting back and working on what the client is saying so this needs to be incorporated i think that's that's my comment thank you sir thank you i think udit it was a wonderful job i am handing over to dr tofan prati sir sir your comments and sir you have to say thanks also because amrit had to leave for an emergency okay udit uh, udit has done an excellent job yesterday i had a talk with him what are you going to do he has done much more than what he had planned fantastic uh, what i feel and the whole what we are achieving by mi motivation or interview is focused is we are having empathic listening to the patient second we are empowering the patient these are the more basic mainstay of motivational interviewing not it is not necessarily a therapy technique like a met with programmed objectives can it not be infused into the normal interviewing because the attitude matters and can we not utilize it for to tackle the problem of non adherence in patients yes sir. It, it has been tried actually a lot uh, mi the purview has actually expanded to a lot of areas as dr vijay was actually mentioning also uh, weight loss programs uh, adherence to diabetic medications adherence to hypertensive medications corporate people now have started using mi for you no know, uh, motivating their clients to achieve their targets uh, earlier so the utilization and the view is expanding it's more of a philosophy on how to speak to people than uh, exactly exactly that's correct yes yes so yes it is about non interfering empathic listening and ultimately empowering your client or patient whatever it is and trying to achieve the objective 
which may you or you not. And other complexities will come up like multiple addiction, family factors, uh, the externalizing aspects, many things will come. I will deal with problems of addiction. This environment where the person stays, there are many other factors because it is a social issue also, a financial issue. But above everything, MI is a good technique so that one should have an attitude of imbibing it and utilizing it wherever it is possible. Thank you, Odette, for your nice presentation. And thank, thanks, Dr. Bijay. Thanks, Dr. Dennis, for your graceful attendance and valuable inputs to the program. And thanks, Karent, for the continued support to us. And on behalf of IPS for the State Branch, I thank for the privilege to have given to all our viewers. We had 250, around 250. So it is, I consider it a good number. Yeah, and thank you. Thank you to you, Tofan sir, also. And, <laughs> and, and, and it's uh, good to announce Dr. Vijay is launching Journal of Psychology. Yes, I, I know I asked him about that. I would like that Dr. Vijay announces it. Yeah, yeah, please, sir. Yeah. Th thanks for the opportunity. Yeah. Uh, so talking about the motivation interviewing, I think Dr. Mahesh, Dr. Sunil and Dr. Bijal actually motivated me to become the journal editor. And I think this was waiting for last four years. And uh, I think they, they, they wanted me to take over. I don't know. And then they decided to come up with this journal plan. And then, uh, you know, uh, I don't know with what motivation I've agreed. Uh, so uh, it is now... Uh, fortunately, uh, I didn't expect. I thought uh, I'll have to uh, write probably four or five articles and I was mentally prepared to write three or four articles to fill in the gaps. I thought uh, I was not going to get enough articles. Fortunately, um, there was a you know um, good number of submissions and uh, fortunately, even though it's uh, first uh, inaugural issue, uh, you know, we had a overflow uh, and uh, I already got 60% uh, for the next issue which may be uh, coming out in September or October even. So I am just been lucky here. So I would invite everyone uh, to please come and uh, support the IPSKC, uh, Dr. Tufan Patti, um, and you know, all uh, Dr. Ali, Ali Siddiqui has also already given Love us to be there and try encouragement. To be there, but if I am not yeah. there, I would like to see what is happening. Yeah. So we would, uh, with, with so many uh, big institutes around in Karnataka, we want to uh, provide a platform for uh, quality uh, you know, articles and please do submit to our you know, journal. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity. Please do join uh, online. Uh, we are not announcing it yet. So we will share the uh, link to join online. So whoever can come, please do let us know uh, and we can arrange, try and arrange something. Yeah, thank you. If I go, I shall be there on my own. That place is very close to me. There are many, many, many people there. I shall go attend it and share your pleasure and come back. But you nowadays, will probably that... see about. I'm expecting you will probably see more than 100, 150, and you get a chance to meet them, sir, Dr. Tufan, sir. So that that probably will inspire him, I guess, Dr. Alim. Thank you. I think I think they have chosen the right person. And when you change in motivation, I think you do not know that you are changing too much. Udit was saying that we are not forcing you to change. We are just nudging you to change. So they have changed you in a good editor, I think. <laughs> so kudos to IPSK. Uh, Udit, thank you so much. Thank you so much. It was really wonderful. Danish Bhai, thank you so much. And Tofan sir, uh, if you allow, then uh, we can now close the session. Sure. Udit, are you hungry? I don't become hungry so soon. No, sir. I have my dinner. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye. Bye. Please close the session.